Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Forrester, Bowman, and Lefkowitz, welcome to today's webinar. Today's seminar topic is the taxation of foreign trusts and related issues. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to our presenters, attorneys Gary Forrester and Brian Page. Hello, and thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a number of topics um, related to foreign trusts. Uh, we'll start with some tax issues. Uh, we'll get into some interesting planning, some asset protection, and then some related issues, you know, e even, even including LLCs and some related cases. Let's move to the index. Agenda, I should say, right? So, you know, after we get into the seminar, um, we'll move to some tax considerations. And as you'll see, many of the of the tax issues raised by foreign trusts are really just a layer on the existing rules governing trust. Um, you know, including the grantor trust rules where trusts are ignored for tax purposes and uh, special rules. Uh, deeming income out to beneficiaries, but some of the real interesting stuff comes with foreign trust and the exit of settlers and beneficiaries from the United States, either before or after forming a foreign trust, which really don't apply to in many other areas of the code. It's a very unique overlay on top of uh, a lot of existing tax rules. I cannot see number three. Foreign trust says something else. What does it say? Oh, foreign trust defined. Okay, so we'll tell you when you have a foreign trust and when you don't. Um, and then this grantor status. Sometimes planning involves actually just having the thing ignored for tax purposes. Sometimes it's better for it to be an actual entity for income tax purposes and how that differs from the estate and gift tax. Um, and then we'll get into some related issues on pre-immigration planning, expatriation, and treaties. Um, do we have a next slide? Yes, yeah. we do. And then it gets more exciting when we start talking about the tax forms you have to file associated with foreign trusts. Brian is going to help out with a lot of these uh, tax rules. Um, if you don't fall asleep during compliance, <laughs> we'll get into as much as we can. It's quite a bit of material for 50 minutes. Uh, on asset protection with foreign and domestic trusts, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of highlight uh, domestic trust so you can see the contrast, uh, as well as um, some of the keys to effectiveness, and then we'll close with some overall concerns and things you should be very careful about. Um, let's get rid of the, the uh, window in the middle. There you go. Oh, perfect. Um, so as an introduction, um, the foreign trust area on the tax side is very unique. Um, years ago, planning was more available in terms of actually diverting income abroad, um, deferring the recognition of taxable income, and also in terms of the estate and gift tax, it was more liberal. And what we're going to get into today, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian for some of this introductory material and some of the compliance work. Um, we've been working on actually a, a foreign trust book. Uh, we're also going to have an introductory article, which goes into some of the details of this stuff. But what, you, what you'll find is, is first you have to figure out whether you have a foreign trust, and then what advantages can you create tax-wise and asset protection-wise with the foreign trust? For instance, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, if you, have a, if you form a foreign trust and it has a U.S. beneficiary, in other words, a, US, a client comes in, he's a U.S. person, he lives here um, and is intends to stay here forever, uh, has kids here, etc., and just is forming a foreign trust for asset protection purposes. Well, in, in, in the, during the Obama administration, basically what happened was Code Section 679 was enacted that says, look, if you're U.S. and you have a U.S. beneficiary, we're just going to disregard this tr trust for income tax purposes. 
So it just doesn't exist. Um, that eliminated a lot of planning for that type of person. But what happens on the estate tax side? And we're going to get into the totally separate issue of estate tax. Oftentimes, once someone thinks that the trust is disregarded for income tax purposes, the, the whole estate tax issue is kind of overlooked. Do you have any in, uh, introductory comments, Brian? No, just that uh, basically, as we'll explain here over time, a lot of these income tax rules, um, which are independent of it, the, the uh, subtitle B transfer tax rules, they're, since they're overlaid, there are times when they don't correspond and they, they, they have results that are unexpected and can be pitfalls when, when you plan. Yeah, it's very, very interesting uh, stuff, pitfalls, especially with people immigrating, uh, immigrating to the United States. Because as we'll talk about, one of the more obvious uh, plans is to move assets outside the U.S. estate tax net before you come in. So if you're a non-resident alien, you're not taxed on assets with respect to the estate tax um, unless they're U.S.-based assets. So if you intend to come in and change your status from non-resident alien to a resident or a citizen, it's usually a good idea to get those assets out of your name um, and into an entity that's not going to bring with it the estate tax when you enter the when, when you enter the country. But a number of issues arise with respect to how long you have to wait. What happens if you get away with it? But then what happens upon death? You you can it can follow you a little bit. It's it's a fascinating area which we'll try to touch on a lot of the major pieces. Okay. So you want to go through the basics? Sure. Or just I mean, in? just just from the uh, from the just the the basis of income tax. Obviously, we have two areas of the code. We have a sub subtitle A and B. A is you know income tax, and B is estate tax or transfer tax. And for all U.S. persons, um, it's pretty straightforward. All all income worldwide is taxed for income taxes if you're a U.S. person or a U.S. resident. Um, that's pretty straightforward. The same, same thing with the estate tax. If you're domiciled here, either long-term resident or not, um, we have the estate tax, gift tax, GST tax on worldwide assets. So it's pretty simple if you're a U.S. Long, uh, resident, permanent resident, or a U.S. citizen. Um, a lot of questions we get in the practice are, what happens if I have two passports? So when you become a citizen, if you're not born here um, or born to U.S. parents, you say to the government that you, uh, I can't, what's the line? You, you reject all foreign regimes, kings and leaders or something odd. You say something <laughs> odd like this. I renounce. Or you, you renounce. I renounce. No, you renounce right. all your other affiliated countries. Of course, no one, you know, they say the words, but a lot of times people retain, a lot of times people retain the other passports. They have two passports, right? So one thing we'll talk uh, briefly upon a little later uh, regarding treaties is um, what happens if you have two passports? Because the U.S. says we're going to tax you on everything you have, um, whether you earn it or you die with it. And maybe the other country says the same thing. So you have to keep in mind that if you retain that second passport, you, you're under you're under a whole different tax net. Which one is it? This one. Yep. Okay, and then obviously, if you're a non-U.S. person, we have very unique rules as well. Um, we we impose the income tax on a U.S. source of income. Now there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part. Uh, if you if you're a non-resident alien and you own assets in the United States and you have income from those a assets, they're taxed from the United States. Um, and they're taxed at different rates depending. If your business income is taxed at graduated rates, um, that's effect, it's called effectively connected business income. And then in passive investment income called PDAPI, um, generally passive rent, interest dividend type stuff 
is taxed at a flat 30% rate. So there's no deduction unless you deal with real estate. You can make an election to be taxed at the graduate rate. And then, and then as, uh, as it regards a foreign trust, the code tells us that it's taxed as a non-resident alien. And so basically, unless it's ECI or a real estate gains, the foreign tr trust is not taxed on its worldwide assets, the income. Um, and of course, if you're a U.S. Benny, uh, the tax is when it's distributed. That's, that's, that's basically the basic rules. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, now for the estate tax, it's a little different. Um, obviously, we have this concept of domicile, and, and we'll talk about that more later, but anyone who is a U.S. resident is taxed, like we said, on their worldwide, but if you're a non-resident, it's only on U.S.-based assets. Everything else is not taxed by our, the transfer taxes that we have. Now, the credit amounts are much lower, 60000 as opposed to $11.4 million if you're a U.S. resident. Um, but it's something to keep in mind, and, and there are ways to plan to not have certain assets taxed in this, in this regime. So the idea is um, to keep in mind that the income tax um, applies to U.S. source income, right, effectively connected or passive. Um, and then the estate tax applies with respect to non-resident aliens to U.S. situs assets. If you take a look, there's a very significant uh, exception to the estate tax for non-resident aliens, and that's gifts of intangible. It's a very underutilized, in general, exception. If you have foreigners who are not residents, they can give intangible property, which does not include cash anymore. It's an idiotic rule, but it doesn't include cash, but it does, inc it does include stocks and bonds, um, free of the gift tax, even if, it's, even if they're U.S. situs assets. Um, the rules differ dramatically with... Um, determining domicile. Is that a different slide? Yes, it is. Okay, we'll talk, about, talk about later. Okay. Um, as regards the foreign trust, first we need to define what that actually means under the tax code. And basically there's a two-part test, two prongs. There's the court test and the control test. A, for a uh, the domestic trust, it must meet both tests. Basically the court test means that a, a U.S. court has the authority authority to bind the trustee and the administration of the trust. The, con the control test is that where is the trustee? If the trustee is in the U.S., it's a domestic. If it's a foreign person, it, it, there's no longer the control test. So you have to have both. So if a trust fails either of these tests, it's a foreign trust. It's a foreign trust. Okay, now this is where the rubber meets the road from the perspective of income tax. Um, if you have a U.S. person that creates a trust, a foreign trust, so it fails one of the tests that, that we just talked about, and they have a U.S. Benny, then there's a special rule, as, as we discussed before, the income tax, basically it's a deemed granted trust under Section 679. So that means that during the lifetime of the individual who, who creates the trust, they're taxed on the income, and it's not any different than being a rev trust for income taxes in the United States. Now, the, the real issue is, is what happens when they die. So let's, let's, let's reiterate, though. So you may create the foreign trust, right? If, you, if the U.S. person creates a foreign trust, and is the beneficiary, or, or a child is the beneficiary, for instance. Um, what, this, what this change in the law did under the Section 679 it says, we're going to completely ignore the trust. It's as if the set law, that the person who founds the trust, owns all the trust assets. So that goes on, and you know, the, the grantor files returns and pays tax as if the grantor owns the assets, the income, the gains, everything else, and then what happens at death? 
Okay, and, and again, understand that this is just income tax. This is not transfer tax. We'll talk about that later. But from the perspective of the income tax, if you have this, this scheme, and so 679 applies, on the grantor's death, there is a there is a imposed mark-to-market dean sale that occurs on all assets that are inside this foreign trust. Okay, that's under section 684. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an exception to this if the if the assets inside the trust are exposed and included as part of the 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 deceased federal estate tax, so it, it included in their gross estate, then this does not apply because, again, it's, it's under this regime where it's going to be taxed. However, most of these trusts, when they're created, that doesn't happen. And so you have a mark a market to market sale on death. And so that is the big thing that happens that you need to be aware of when you have these types of entities that it can be, you know, if you don't know it's there, it can be a big deal, the 6884. So there's a way to plan at times to get around this, but you need to be aware that that is how it's structured now and that is what the current rule is. So so the 684 occurs, that's the deemed sale of trust assets occurs, if in fact when, when the assets went into the trust, the assets then left the taxable estate of the grantor. So if, what happens is if the tax, if the assets leave the estate of the grantor, then they're in, and then when the grantor dies, those assets are no longer in the estate of the grantor, and then are subject to this mark-to-market sale. So the decision is, okay, when we form the trust, we know it's gonna be disregarded if we have a U.S. beneficiary, and then Okay, do we transfer the assets in under the gift tax rules? Do we complete a gift, pay the gift tax? Or do we say, you know what, what we're going to do is we're, go we're, we're well under the exemption amount and, and the assets, including all the other assets of the grantor, are well under what's now you know, $11.4 million. And we're not going to complete the gift. We're not going to do, quote, estate tax planning we're going to let the assets be. We're just looking for the protections of a foreign trust so that when the grantor dies, the grantor has a taxable estate and you don't suffer the mark-to-market rules. I mean, we, we kind of see this from time to time. A lot of times we're brought in late to the game. So, you know, often people will come in, they really didn't plan, um, a lot of times people are offshore and do this. The rules are somewhat different. We will get into that. But um, And they made the gift. They made the gift already, and now we have to figure out what to do to avoid the deemed sale of assets on debt. It's very onerous because if you actually made the gift, you actually pay the gift tax already, and now you've got to pay as if you sold all the assets. The, this This regime came into being because in uh it was like 1997 um what had happened was the idea of an exit tax was imposed on the american people so very few people understand this including a lot of cpas and, and tax professionals but if you're a u.s person and you leave the country you have to pay an exit tax we're gonna we're kind of gonna have to probably gloss this area it's in later slides a little bit but that tax is this mark to market as if you sold everything. So this is kind of a, a mirrored provision um, with respect to foreign trusts that if in fact you get everything out of the country, right, it's no longer part of your estate, that when you die, you have to pay the mark to market tax. I, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a little cumbersome and doesn't really hit the issue perfectly. But that's where it's derived from. Assets are leaving the country, and they're no longer going to be subject to a state tax. So we're going to go ahead and tax them as if you sold them all. Right. And so the flip side is, is that if you create, if you're a U.S. person and you create a foreign trust with no U.S. penny, mm -hmm. then 684 applies immediately upon the, the transfer of the assets to the foreign trust. Now, this is independent of transfer taxes. This is just for income taxes. Yeah. And and this is one of the few areas 
where income tax, actually, I think it's probably the only area, where income tax is impacted by estate tax. Very rare those two cross over, but here, if in fact you pay the gift tax, well, then you have to pay the income tax on the mark to market when you die. If you don't pay the gift tax, then you've got the estate tax when you die and you don't pay the mark to market tax. It's a, it's an interplay between the two areas of the code. That's that's I don't I don't know of another instance actually where, where that where that occurs. It's, it's complicated, but it's you can work it out. We're gonna get through like seven slides. <laughs> We've got like seventy slides. Yeah, well, this is such a broad area. Um, the issue though is uh, so, but for if you're an NRA though, a non-resident alien. non-resident alien, uh, any of these, uh, if you create a foreign trust, obviously it'll be respected. And there, as long as it's not funded with a, a U.S. situs asset, there's going to be no tax. So if foreign assets are used to fund the foreign trust by the non-resident alien, there's no a U.S. tax. There's no there's no connection. Right. right. There's, 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 there's no nexus. There's no nexus. We call it connexus. It's connection between a foreigner and foreign asset. So if someone's considering, hey, maybe I'll go to the states within the next five or ten years. Um, I'm going to start to get assets out of my name permanently into a foreign trust so that when I come in, I don't bring them into the estate tax net. That's a very common planning. I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's done enough. And we find so many people that come in that really don't think about these issues at all. And the numbers even can be staggering with some of the people that come into our office. Um, so we have to kind of work things backwards. But if we can get to people early, um, there's a lot of tremendous planning to do to avoid the state tax. And of course, if the uh, the, the foreign trust is being created by a non-resident alien from it, for it, the income taxes, obviously there's the source income rule for the foreign trust itself. But as for the U.S. binnies, um, you know, obviously, if income is distributed, that is when they would potentially recognize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, obviously, um, if a foreign individual, non-resident alien, makes a gift of foreign assets, there's no tax imposed on those assets. That's the easy, straightforward rule. And then that um, it's possible um, for them to create a foreign trust for their like benefit and um, and even if they if they if they later on come into the United States into where that it's out and it, it will never be um, touched by either the, by the, the the US transfer tax like regime let's see what those rules are this is pretty good yeah this <laughs> this is interesting I mean because you know uh, this is what we see a lot is that even if they think that they've planned and they've made gifts, if they create a foreign trust, so you have a non-resident alien, they create a they fund a trust, fund a trust, a foreign trust that fails the two tests that we had before, then they decide to obtain residency in the United States. Well, if they take all these steps and they come in within five years from funding the trust, well, for income tax reasons, it's a deemed contribution on the date that they that they obtained their uh, residency. Okay. Yeah, so so they come in, right, and they had funded this trust four years ago. So they think all of these foreign assets are outside of their of the basically the income tax net. The, 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 we say income tax, but it's this it's this six seventy nine, six eighty four, which is really similar to the state tax part of income tax net. And it's as if they now are funding on the day they enter the foreign trust. So now they've got this issue with respect to um, them being established in terms of grantor status, which means that, that they have to recognize income on everything in the trust as it, as it occurs. And then, what, and then mark to market sale when they die. It's uh, it's very it's got to be very careful with this five year rule, and that includes appreciation as well of the assets that are inside the oh, foreign yeah. trust during that time. Now again, for U.S. transfer tax purposes, these assets are out. 
This is just for in, just for income tax. But it's as if you create. It's almost as if you create like it's a state issue. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. As we discussed before, we know the expatriation tax. This this was an imposed about over 20 years ago, and the idea being that if a U.S. resident leaves, that um, our our government says no, you're going to pay a market to market tax deemed sale on all your assets. It's like a capital gains hit if you leave the country. We're we're gonna we're gonna gloss through a few slides here. There was a prior regime for this, which was very complicated. We're starting to get several years beyond that regime. Um, that regime involved you leaving a U.S. person leaving the country, and then the his, the assets of that person being tainted for ten years. But I don't think we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. It is part of the presentation, but it's only related to. Um, this, or, this is who's an expatriate right, right. and who's not an expatriate. Um, this is the rule 877 on the 10 year taint. Um, so let's see. It's, so it's, yeah. So it's, if it's for people who expatriated between, uh, 04 and 08. So it's getting a little stale. Believe it or not, we've actually had this recently just come up, but it won't come up much if it ever in, in a regular practice. We just had to do a lot of foreign work. Um, and so you had this waiting period, basically, of 10 years when someone left the country. Um, and, this, and, and, and along with the new rule, which we're about to get into, it's both an income and a gift in estate tax. Uh, it was a 10-year taint. Now we're basically dealing with, same, same idea here, um, the hard act. we're dealing with the hard act, which, begin, which began in 08, which is this idea that if you renounce your citizenship, it applies. But what very, very few practitioners understand is that if someone's here as a foreign individual on a green card for eight or 15 years, not a citizen, and they leave, they renounce their green card because they don't want to be subject to uh, U.S. tax worldwide, it applies. The deem sale applies. It's a very onerous tax, and um, there's probably a few hundred thousand people, because uh, we're dealing with so many people now, um, affected by it, I at, least. at least. I mean, because people are just leaving, thinking, oh, I'm going to go back home, everything's all right now, I I've got more assets there than I do here, by far. That's where I want to live, that's where my, my grandkids are, whatever. It's a deemed sale of all your assets on Earth. Everywhere, right? So it's it's very, very onerous. Brian, I'll take you through some of the details. It's pretty interesting. I think, yeah, the other thing here is, as well as, not only is there an exit tax, but then forever after, there is a taint, an inheritance tax, on any any gifts that are made to U.S. bennies at, after this fact. And and what's what's interesting about that way that law is written it's hard to tell if it really expires. No, it doesn't. It doesn't really expire. It expires. It's not <laughs> forever. So what they don't want you to do is leave the country, become non-U.S., so you're not subject to the estate or gift tax on certain things, and then start giving things to the U.S. people. Uh, yeah, what they do is they, they take the gift tax and what would normally be a tax on the donor, and they make it a tax on the donee. Um but 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 you don't get a, a step up in basis on the tax you pay on the exit tax. On, on the you don't tax. you don't get credit for the tax, right? That's right. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's kind of crazy, actually. So basically, when the exit tax occurs, I mean, again, it has to um, apply. And, and and the slide that we had before, we want to see that. Yeah, that the that we we have the chart. We provide you with a chart. Yeah. That explains to you. When this applies, because now I mean it's it's going to be under there this, are exceptions. It's exceptions, yeah. yes. But again, there are three tests. If you were a a U.S. resident, you know either you're you were born here, you, you become naturalized, or if you're a green card holder and you've been here for you know eight out of the last fifteen years, this potentially will apply. Then it is, how do you determine that? And then if there are three tests, if if you're 
you know, individual meets any of these three tests, then this tax applies. There's the net worth test. Uh, you're worth more than two million dollars. You have to be worth more than two, right, or it yes. doesn't apply. Right. Or your annual, you know, income tax liability test, and that's based and again, that's indexed for for last year, because that's what we're doing the taxes now. If, if they made more than 165 thousand in a year or if they fail to file all the forms that are required. So even if they, they fail the, the net worth and yet average annual mm -hmm. income tax, you have to be in compliance. You have to be in compliance. File the forms with, with the IRS and make sure you've filed all your past returns. And there's some real detail that we don't get into in the seminar, but there's some really weird stuff with this where you can file with the you know ICE and get out and, and have your green card rejected, but you have to file that a certain form with the IRS, and if you don't, it doesn't count, and it, it's it get it's just totally complicated. Uh, so if it, if you see that occurring, just just give us a call. Okay, let's see here. So if we get back to the Heart Act, this is the mark to market, okay, right. where where when you leave, it's a deemed sale of everything you own on Earth. And then it go ahead and talk about Brian the 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 corresponding inheritance. Sure, side. sure. Just I just want to say one last thing about the eight seven. 7A, the, the exit tax. On that case, you are given a basis step up on that income tax. Yes, but the inheritance tax is a transfer tax It's found in subtitle B. Um, and basically, it imposes the estate tax on any any gift from an individual who has been exposed. So a, a person that's left the United States has paid the exit tax. Later on, at any time, if they give a gift to a, a U.S. Benny, this inheritance tax, which is paid by the U.S. Benny who receives the tax, this inheritance tax, it's Section 2801. Um, and it is something that never ends. If, if it applies, at least under current law, it, everything's going to be covered from then on. And as we said before, the, the person who pays the tax in the United States who gets the gift gets no step up. Which is yeah, it's crazy. It's nuts. And then of course, um, that's the calculation. Yeah, that talk about the, the calculation there. It's pretty straightforward. And then I, I have a, an example on the next page. But the key thing though is this: is if we talked about this before, the U.S. estate tax and all the transfer taxes are based on a concept of domicile. And it's important to understand what that actually means. It's physical presence and an intent to remain. You have to have both. And so potentially there are ways to plan before a person expatriates to where for income taxes, you're still a U.S. resident, but for transfer taxes, you're not. And so potentially <clears throat> there's a planning option to get rid of worldwide assets and avoid U.S. You know, taxes when that's actually done. Well, what happens is sometimes we cannot avoid the U.S. income tax or we or we can eliminate double taxation. In other words, if we're foreign, we're, we're incurring U.S. income tax for whatever reason or we're a U.S. Um, resident for income tax purposes and have to pay tax on our worldwide income and try to deduct tax or use treaties with respect to income tax we pay in other countries. But what we want to focus on is if we're just going to do that and we're not going to stay here forever, not becoming a U.S. domiciliary for estate and gift tax purposes. There are different standards, and one in terms of the income tax is fairly temporary, whereas the other one only occurs on transfer. So if you're okay with earning income or you're here for a while, what we don't want to do is then bring all of your assets on earth into the states to pay estate tax if you die here. Because remember, even if you die here and you didn't intend to stay here, it wasn't it wasn't where you intended to die, um, you're not subject to estate tax. You have to be here and you have, and the intent is that you're that you're gonna stay here until you die. And the treaties, um, we get into some detail here, but there are two types of treaties. And basically, the, the intent of the treaties is to eliminate double taxation, either on the income side or the estate and gift side. A lot of, actually, 
almost all of the treaties are segregated. They're either income tax treaties or they're estate gift tax treaties. Some treaties don't have a gift provision. Several don't have a gift tax provision. So you have to be careful with the country you're dealing with. Uh, you may have an income tax treaty without an estate tax treaty. So on the income tax side, you say, I'm from France. It's domiciliary base, which means I'm a French domiciliary. Um, I've got U.S. income tax, but France says I only have, but the, you, I only have to pay tax in France because the treaty says that the domiciliary pays tax to the domiciliary base. So the same would be true for a U.S. person earning income based in France. The U.S. person pays only income tax to the United States. Estate tax is separate. It's a totally different deal. If the Frenchman moves here and stays here for a while, says, you know, I think I may stay here, uh-oh, and, and dies, the, the Frenchman pays U.S. estate tax on all assets worldwide and potentially French estate tax because there's no treaty. I, that's, that's just made up, though. There is a treaty with France, but in <laughs> our example, example right. there's, there's no treaty, okay? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that's my life, you know. Um, this goes through some details with the treaties. Sometimes they're domiciliary based, which means what we went through, where you live, and sometimes they're asset based. So it's something, or it'll say something like, wherever the real estate is, if the real estate sold or, or derives income, that's the jurisdiction where it's at. That taxes the real estate part of that transaction. A lot of times it's where a real estate is, it's where a business is. There, it's it's uh, based on where the asset is based. All right. And also understand that every country, it, it's all unique. It's bilateral for it. So we might have, the United States might have one with France, but not with China or something like that. Everyone's unique. You need to be aware of that. So we're going into the last 10 minutes before questions. So this is compliance, which I leave to Brian. This is the fun don't stuff. Don't fall asleep. Right here. Um, <laughs> these are forms you need to be aware of. You have uh, clients that are either they create a foreign trust, treat it as the owner of a foreign trust, or receive distributions from a, a foreign trust. You need to be aware of these. Um, form 3520 is the main form. Basically, uh, it, it reports a lot of information to the IRS. Even if it's not taxable, it still reports it. So if, for a compliance perspective, you need to make sure that these are being filed each year. They're done annually. If, if you have a U.S. person who creates a trust, obviously they have to file it annually because they're treated as the owner of a foreign trust for income tax purposes. Well, well, the 35, that's a good point. The 3520 is what the IRS looks at when they make a determination, okay, is there a U.S. beneficiary? Are you going to be disregarded for tax purposes? Do you have to pay a state tax when you when you you know, die on these assets, or does the mark-to-market -market regime apply? Because during these years, it, especially if it's disregarded, there's no income tax filing otherwise. You're just filing as if you own them. So there's no different form. You have. This form brings the IRS up to date. So if someone, for instance, if you, if you started a foreign trust and there were no U.S. beneficiaries, and someone came in two years later, they would pick it up on the 3520. And basically, it's due at the same time as the individual income tax return is, April the 15th. Yeah. And that includes extensions. Also, too, and I'll talk about this here in a minute, um, the Form 3520A, which is, foreign, which is uh, filed by the trustee of the foreign trust each year, they have to provide the U.S. owner a statement from that, that that shows that they are the owner and, and what the um, imputed income tax is from the entity. Right. So you have to attach right. that. Now, that form, and we'll get to it now, um, is due March the 15th, so a month before the annual uh, tax returns are due. Um, as I just said, it's an annual return that's done by the foreign trustee. Um, and again, there's, so there's, there'll be a statement that is also sent to the beneficiaries of the trust as well. If they yeah. receive a distribution in a given tax year. It's basically a blanket disclosure of everyone and all money involved in the trust. Right. And of course, if you're a U.S. Benny, even if the income that you receive or the distribution that you receive is not taxable, 
you still have to file this informational return. Very important. Okay, here are some other things that will probably apply as well. We have FATCA. Um, obviously, you know, if you have these foreign assets and they and they uh, exceed these these values, you have to re report them on Form 8938 each year. Make sure you stay in, in compliance with that. Uh, you also have the FBARs with FinCEN. That's pretty straightforward as well. But these are all these other forms that are important because if you don't file them like you're supposed to each year, the penalties can be severe. To totally ridiculous in some cases, much more than the assets at issue. So it's it's just a question of, of getting getting the forms together every time you file. Well, we have a few minutes. Um, I know you can write questions in. I I, I, I don't think I could save my life to figure out how you do it. But you go into the – oh, is that somebody? Who's that? Uh, we have a question. We have a question? There. Okay. I can find a way to get up there. I thought that's what it said. Excuse me, I'm trying it to – It says, get... that's to say renounced after five years, not just moves. Yes, that's correct. So someone someone had a question that says that's to say renounced after five years, not just moved. So I think what that – oh, I see, yeah, because the window's in the way. But yeah. I think what the question was intended to address was the exit tax on someone leaving. So, yes, you would have to – if you're a citizen, you'd have to renounce your citizenship. If you're a resident – you would have to give up your green card and file the IRS form that says I'm completely out of here. I have no more ties to the U.S. I believe that's 8854, the IRS form of yeah. compliance. It's in the article. Yeah. Um, we're, we'll take questions, but I, I for some reason, and I'll and I'll and I'll leave it to our tech man. Um, we can't really see. Um, we see a window in blue. That's a reiteration of the question, but there's a question there that ends in the word lapses, yeah. and we can't see it. Oh, there it is. What happened? I hit a button. Great. That was a good button. <laughs> what if one sells every asset and reinvests in an opportunity zone area without U.S. taxes, then moves after the 160K five-year average lapses? What if one sells every asset? And re well, when you sell, you're hit with capital gains tax. I don't know if this is a. Um, I, I'm assuming this is a U.S. person. If one sells, you get the, the capital gains and reinvest in an opportunity zone without U.S. taxes. Okay, then moves after the 160k after five-year average lapses. He's trying to. He's, he's, I, think, I believe he's trying to ask about the exit tax to see if he would meet the income requirement threshold. So, so, so if apply. you don't meet the income requirement threshold, you're fine. Right. But again, if, if you've sold all the assets and you've already paid the capital gains and you exit with cash, there's no tax due because it's mark to market. Well, also, if you if you reinvest, your basis is probably going to be near the value of those assets, so a mark-to-market -market sale will not cause you to incur much tax. I hope that answers your question. Go ahead and write in whatever you want. We'll, we'll, we'll address it immediately. Um, we had a few more slides on the basics, basis, basics of asset protection. Um, you know, we use these foreign trusts, but we also use a lot of domestic trusts and limited liability companies. Um, there, oh, I see. Um, We do, we've done a number of seminars. We have 11 commandments of asset protection, actually. So we've done, we have 11 seminars. If you ever have a question, we can, we can provide you any information you need on asset protection or my book for attending. You get a book. Just let us know if you want a book. Um, it's uh, ForsterBowman.com, and we'll send you a book on asset protection. But basically what asset protection involves is it's, either structuring assets that are exposed, putting them into trusts or LLCs, um, titling assets, which 
means that actually holding assets, for instance, as husband and wife, creates a tremendous amount of protection. Um, or using using the trust system. Do we have another question? That says how we can provide you with the slides. If yeah, you just send us an email. Email us. That's one of the questions that we have. Um, the other one. We, we, we answered the one about five years. And then is there anything else here? We answered that question. And then apart, apart from, from entities, which were the trusts and LLCs, and the titling, which is like tenancy by the entirety, certain assets are exempt. So the third rung on the tree are, are exempt assets. You can buy certain life insurance in certain states, depending on the exemption in the state, 529 plans, IRAs, et cetera. Like in Florida, those are not touchable. So if you work with, with your entities, your titling, and your assets, you usually can really deal with a lot of protection um, and often together. So for instance, if you have an asset, for instance, a piece of property that's in a state that doesn't allow for much protection, okay? For instance, you wanted to take the property tenancy by the entirety, where the plaintiff would require a suit against both husband and wife to reach the asset. Many states do not allow you to take that asset as tenancy by the entirety. So what we do in these cases is we go to a jurisdiction that allows tenancy by the entirety and has an LLC. So we say, okay, Delaware, we're going to form an LLC and we're going to own the LLC as tenancy by the entirety. And that LLC is going to acquire the property, so we wrap up the property in a protective entity that's held by the entirety. 